Welcome back to Talking Guitar, brought to you by the Carter Vintage Exchange and the North American Guitar in Nashville, Tennessee. Lindsay here, and this week we're changing it up and chatting not with a luthier, but with award-winning fingerstyle guitarist Matt Thomas, who is both an incredible player and hugely passionate about luthier-built guitars, putting him right at the center of the Venn diagram of music and craftsmanship. You may already be familiar with Matt through his videos for Cedar Rock Studio and his performances at the guitar showcases, or maybe you know him because he shared the stage with Tommy Emanuel, Muriel Anderson, Stephen Bennett, Dustin Furlow, and so many others. Matt's an inspiring player who defies genre, and he's just a lot of fun to talk to because he's so curious and knowledgeable, much like our friend and luthier Jeff Jewett, who comes up a lot in this chat. We have tons to talk about, so I won't draw this out any longer. Just enjoy my chat with Matt Thomas. This will be kind of like the preamble, I guess, to sort of give some perspective on on where I want this to go. Because obviously it's like, yeah, it's a guitar podcast. You want to talk to more musicians. But the kind of the, my reasoning behind that was more like, you know, spending all this time talking to luthiers and focusing on more like the craftsman side, side of things. And it, which is, which is great. I've learned so much, but like prior to being in this sort of position, like I, I didn't really come to guitar with a lot of interest in that side of it. I was just very music focused. Like I just wanted a guitar that worked for me, made the sounds that I wanted it to make work for my playing style mm-hmm. done. Like I was, I was like, I'm a one guitar kind of gal. I'm very satisfied like that. But now like having been in this, this, like the music retail side for a few years, I kind of almost feel like it's flipped a little bit where that's all I think about. And I've almost like lost touch with the music a little bit. And the music's why we came here in the first place. Like that's why all this matters. And that's the interesting thing is when you first kind of start off, you work with what you have yeah, and you make that work. And I mean, for forever, just until recently, I've been playing factory guitars with specs that weren't always ideal. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's what you've always played. Yeah. So you 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 play it. So yeah. um, but then all of a sudden you meet luthiers that are doing unique things and different ergonomic features. And suddenly you feel it and you're like, I don't want to go back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I've been missing this my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it is it is kind of a, a eye opening experience and. It also becomes an ear opening experience yeah to me because then i suddenly realize oh there's different possibilities with these different instruments so they get they have more dynamic value to them there's different things that you're able to achieve on them mm-hmm. so suddenly it can make you that much of a better player yeah and that's exactly why i wanted to talk to somebody like you who is a virtuosic player who inspires other players and talk about that relationship that you have with the instruments that you play and how that can drive you forward or not, you know, dep- depending on what kind of instrument you end up picking up. But obviously for somebody who has the good fortune to have a lot of options, usually it's going to drive you forward and expand your expand your world, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, so just, just a little back. I mean, I'm sure most people who watch the Teen Egg channel know who you are to some extent because we kind of inhabit this similar worlds or same worlds. Maybe. I mean, I'm still fairly new to this market, to be yeah. honest. Um, I'm I'm honored to be doing it. Um, and there's so many people that I've only chatted with online. I've never actually yeah. met them. So it's fun to finally get into the world of like the guitar festivals and the luthier festivals where these people are attending them. So you mm-hmm. actually get to meet them finally. Yeah. So that it's it's a very honorable position to be in yeah yeah and for for anybody who doesn't have a lot of backstory on you i mean you're a finger you know your finger style champion you've won multiple championships international u.s based um you have all sorts of albums out you play live ever, all over the place um and, and, and yeah and like you've and now you obviously you work with cedar rock and so people might find you that way and see you talking about guitars there or they might have found you through jeff jewett representing <laughs> nice <So>. sweatshirt <laughs> matching matching sweatshirt buddies 
Um, but yes, I feel like you're kind of the perfect and oh, and just and to add to that, you're also interested in Luthery in a way where you might pursue it someday. So you're kind of the perfect musician to talk to in a Luthier podcast because you cover so much of the same ground and you yeah, you just you get it. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I so, try or at least try. I like to, or at least I think I try. I, I, I think, think you therefore try I am. <laughs> I, I feel like you, yeah, you, you and Jeff are like two of the like most like hardworking, like driven people I've ever encountered where it's just like, oh, you guys, you. I just want to hang out with you guys. Cause you're just so, yeah, you just, you're, there's just so much to like learn from you and to, to be inspired by. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to chat with you more. Well, and... I kind of, I got bit by the bug early. So, yeah. um, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I became addicted. Um, really what kind of started it all is I saw Tommy when I was like 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, he was just first starting to come to the States. And I, at that time, was playing electric guitar. And someone said, hey, I've got these tickets to this flamenco concert <laughs> with this guy, Tommy Emmanuel. And I'm like, oh, that sounds flamenco. And... <laughs> It just, it, it blew my world. So mm -hmm. I, I obsessed over it the whole year. And the next year, uh, Tommy pulled me on stage and had me play with him. And oh, damn. That, I haven't wanted to do anything ever since. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've been completely obsessed with the instrument in almost an unhealthy way at times. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it, I've refused to get the normal job. So I... I've always beat the streets and done as many gigs as I can, mm -hmm. local, abroad. Um, and what I kind of found in the early days, before the internet was really a big thing, mm -hmm. was you, you, had, you had to win competitions to get your name out there, or else nobody mm -hmm. would even take a second look at you. They wouldn't book you for things. You had to have some clout. Mm -hmm. So that's that was actually Tommy's influence. He kind of said, oh, you know, okay. there's there's a really cool competition out at Merle Travis's home in Kentucky. Go and compete. So mm -hmm. I did, and I, I won that two years in a row and then got inducted into the Hall of Fame for thumb picking at mm -hmm. the Merle Travis Museum. Um, and then got invited out to CAS, which is the Chet Atkins Convention in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And the diverse bunch of players just set me off. I, I was just, <laughs> I had such a wonderful time kind of opening and broadening my mind on the different ways that you could play finger style music, thumb picking, not thumb picking, just actual finger style. And then another one that really just <sighs> blew my gourd was Yosho Stefan from Germany, mm -hmm. a gypsy jazz player. And I think I spent the majority of the time every evening we were up until five, six in the morning, just <laughs> having gypsy jams. And I I'm addicted to that kind of stuff. I absolutely love the camaraderie of playing with other people and hanging out and trading licks and ideas because it, it it's its own language. Mm -hmm. um, I, I grew up in a music school and somehow, I don't know why, but in schools, they don't really, they, they have them as separate arts. There's music and there's language, there's poetry, there's drama, and there's all these things. So to me, I've really focused on the entity that is music. So mm -hmm. it's its own language to me. So yeah. I never really picked up singing or memorizing lyrics or things like that. So when I hear music, I don't hear the words. I hear the melodies, <laughs> but I'm so I was like, oh, did you hear what they just said in that song? I'm like, what? <laughs> There's words. Yeah, you're just um, not vocal or lyric. Lyric. Uh, no, at all. to to me, you know, yeah. music has its own, you know, things to say. So where the melody is in contrast to the chords, what the melody leads to, things like that, is always been something that really intrigues me. So when i sit down and play with other players or listen to them it's really interesting to hear their ideas of phrasing and how they mm. are to speak and that that's something just so intriguing that i try to mimic as many of those different ideas as possible that way so that i have just broadened my own language base mm -hmm. so 
I, I try not to lock myself in the box of, oh, I'm a thumb picker or, you know, oh, I'm a flat picker. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be a guitar player. I want to do it all. So I aim for the stars and fire and see where you land. Sometimes it's <laughs> just in the backyard, but at least you've gotten somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, it's, I kind of just knew you as like a finger stylist at first, but then kind of digging in, you know, seeing more of your videos and chatting with you at Artisan and everything. I was like, oh shit, like your background is like, or your, your sort of approach is very eclectic and very expansive. And to, you're you're hard to pigeonhole in that regard because it's not just like like I'm kind of like a Celtic finger stylist kind of person like very like I've got my little box that I'm in and I'm that's fine I'm totally fine with that but like yeah your style is just like very you just you pull in a lot of stuff which is really interesting well I was very fortunate that it wasn't just Tommy that was at that that concert at that time he was touring heavily with Stephen Bennett mm -hmm. so at the same time, I got exposed to this really radical, energetic music. I got exposed to the harp guitar. Mm -hmm. And i that's another thing I absolutely fell in love with. But I was in a very unique position because Stephen was from my area. And he was hosting the harp guitar gatherings at the Williamsburg Library. And okay. they were having the second ever, ever gathering. And... It was all over the, the news, the newspaper and all that stuff. And the morning of the gathering, a family friend came by and dropped off the Merrill Stephen Bennett number two harp guitar that had just been made and said, I don't know how to play it. <laughs> Take it and go there and figure out how to play something on it. And I was entirely too embarrassed to wait till I got there. I was like, no way in, in hell am I going to actually show up with this thing and not know how to play it so <laughs> I, I i spent the whole first half of the day just trying to figure out how it's tuned and figure out okay what can i do so that i don't look like a complete idiot <laughs> in front of stephen bennett so and of course he had just seen me on stage with tommy at the concert mm -hmm. and here i come walking in with a harp guitar and he just looks at me and goes okay you little punk come here <laughs> and he's like is this some cruel joke who put you up to this i said no i I'm serious. I, I want to play harp guitar. Um, so it's always been a very Jekyll and Hyde thing. Um, mm. So in all of my shows, I, I always love to start with the harp guitar and kind of ease into the more energetic fingerstyle stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, it really, it's been such a wonderful kind of fan base because there's, there's such a variety of different listeners. Some people really enjoy more of the the ballad side of the music and just nice slow melodic stuff which the harp guitar is just the best at yeah the sympathetic resonance <laughs> and not only that just the low end of it it, yeah. it just the way it 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 feels in your chest is a very unique feeling so i i've just adored playing both sides of of the instruments mm -hmm. and trying to translate the benefits of each to each other as well. So, mm -hmm. um, cause most hard guitar music is just slower. So I, I try to find ways to go, okay, let's stretch the boundaries a little bit. Um, you know, Hedges was more of an energetic harp guitar player, which mm -hmm. that's what most people know. But then you listen to Steven and he writes some of the most amazing ballads the world will ever hear. And his catalog is so vast. I, there's no way I'll ever catch up. <laughs> so I, I'm not trying to. I don't want to compete with that. I just want yeah. to be in the same in the same vein and make yeah. sure that the harp guitar doesn't just disappear from society. So yeah. that's that's been a problem all the years is, you know, people think it's just an old world instrument, but there's there's so many great new luthiers kind of starting to build them like yeah. Kathy, Kathy Winger. Oh, my goodness her harp guitars just sound so phenomenal. And mm -hmm. another one that's really up there is Michel Pellerin. Oh, I didn't realize that he's, I mean, of course he's built harp guitars. That kind of makes sense, but oh, yes. I haven't seen one. Oh, oh no. uh, they had one at the Woodstock Luthier Showcase last oh. year. And um, I just played a few little things on it because there is a lot of different schools of 
tunings for harp guitar. So mm -hmm. like Muriel Anderson, she does all descending sub basses okay. where they've actually kind of coined the phrase, the Stephen Bennett tuning. And oh. he actually, the first sub bass that you get to is actually higher than your lowest E string and they call it the re-entry tuning. Mm -hmm. And what it allows for is actually creating chord structure and the sub basses rather than just using them as bass notes. Mm -hmm. So mm. um, unfortunately, the, the Pellerin was set up in the Muriel style wow. tuning, um, <laughs> which just throws your brain off. On top of it, it had an extra sub bass too <laughs> and a, a high treble bank. So there's so many options that you can get with the harp guitars that yeah. really, if you're, if you're up for the challenge, it helps you really create some amazing music. Um, it just, it deters a lot of people because they look at it and get intimidated, but <laughs> it's really not all that hard. I've figured it out in half a day. So <laughs> show me what you guys can do. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's like once you, yeah, you just get used to where those strings are. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's if you can relearn the guitar in different tunings, you can add some extra strings. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. It's not super crazy. I mean, it's it's crazy, but it's not totally crazy. <laughs> well, especially since, you know, you get to keep the tuning how you are yeah. used to. So you yeah. get to choose what sub basses you want mm -hmm. or what high tinkly things you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it just kind of depends on what blows your skirt up. So <laughs> I, I mean, for, for me, I've always liked the low end. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've never really attempted to to get my hands on the ones with the extra high treble bank um mm -hmm. and that's something that actually me and michelle pellerin talked about is i mean a lot of them the the scale length on them is just so little that the tone of the the trebles is a little pinky mm -hmm. you, you you pluck it and it's yeah. just tink 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 it's like um, an effect but not really very usable exactly where um he decided to extend the scale length of okay. those the actual string to give it more body um and there's there's another person that that has actually created a really cool thing that muriel helped come up with luke bruner uh created a snap-on high treble bank that you can put on oh. your six string your guitars on anything and it it, it comes with a K&K &K pickup like loaded in it. So, I mean, you can pretty much put it on anything or even just get it and play it as a simple scale. So, wow. you know, there there's advancements in, in the luthier community that just benefit the musicians. Yeah. Um, you get so much, so much more of a tonal palette that way. So, yeah, there's so much room for like partnership to create new things. And it's, I feel like it's easy to either not, well, either you don't realize that that's a possibility and you just stick in your lane of like six string guitar, or, you know, Martin Taylor, or whatever, or it can almost be like tempting to get too much into like this, this fancy new thing and that fancy new thing and this new idea. But yeah, if you can bring the, if you can take one of those ideas and really run with it and make something out of it, I mean, that's just, yeah, just, it, it, there's so many possibilities. Well, and oddly enough, a lot of these luthiers are are up for a challenge or up yeah. for a slight subtle change that, you know, doesn't really deter too much from their current work. Um, mm -hmm. And it it's really great to work with these people because they they listen. So if any of you that are listening, I encourage you reach out to a luthier that you like and try to create something with them because mm -hmm. they're most likely going to nail it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like, there are some guys who maybe don't really feel, and maybe they're too busy or they just kind of like, they're, they're like, I have my thing. I'm just going to keep doing some variation of that thing. But some guys like Jeff, like Kevin Miterman's another, another luthier I can think of who's really oh, God. into try, like he'll do so many prototypes and he's really like ready to take on those kinds of challenges. And I'm sure there are tons more that I'm just like, not thinking of at the moment, but yeah, it's, there's a lot more of that possibility than, than people probably think of at first for sure. Well, it was, it was such an honor befriending Jeff. Um, mm -hmm. cause I, I was doing demos at Cedar rock and one of his guitars came across in the batch. And immediately after I got home, he called me and said, okay, roast me. And I went, Oh, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> tell me, tell me your true impressions 
of my guitar against like the Samajis mm -hmm. or, you know, the, the Raymond Krauts and the Buendias and things like that. Like, do you think they're on par or do you think that I could get a sound close to that? What do you think I could change? What, what do you like? What don't you like? And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that's great about his instruments is when you pick them up, they feel familiar. So mm -hmm. if you've grown up playing factory instruments, he kind of goes off of similar body styles like Martin's. Mm -hmm. So a traditional OM, which most of, have, most of us have grown to love where that sits on our lap. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of the new age luthiers are doing things like taking their own OM yeah. shapes. Um, and a lot of them are lengthened and I'm a little guy. Uh, I'm I'm petite, so yeah, I, I kind I'm of like, yeah, a little smaller. I, I yeah, I like it. <laughs> I like a small guitar that he's got a big voice to it. So, mm -hmm. and I had noticed, you know, off of that first guitar of Jess that it had unusual headroom, and I just kind of said, you know, did you do something special on there? Is it is it like Addy bracing or something? He said, you got it. <laughs> uh, that the the X brace was Adirondack, and so was the tone bar. So it actually had a little more headroom than most guitars typically have. So mm -hmm. we just started talking about different ideas and bracing patterns, and you know, he I'd call him each day, he'd call me the next day, and it ended up being we're like best friends. We we talk mm -hmm. just about every day, and. Anytime we see something cool online or that something somebody's doing, we send it to each other and it's like, oh, how cool is that? Did you see <laughs> him? Did you see that Luthier nail that miter line? Or did you see that rosette concept? And it's it's just it's so much fun to have a, that kind of relationship with someone who geeks out about the same things that I do. So yeah. I, I've always really enjoyed that side of of Luthery and what people are able to do that is something a little more artistic than usual yeah um so we just we started concepting and i kind of as soon as we started talking i had a back injury and i slipped a slipped a disc in my low back Oof. um so far out that it it pretty much shut off my left leg so oh I, my God. I, had, I had to cancel i was on i was getting ready to head to a gig and I couldn't hardly get in the car. So oh. I, I went straight to the emergency room and called the, the, the venue. They were pissed, but I, <laughs> like, I was I like, literally I'm literally <laughs> in the emergency room not, right now. I can come and try to do the gig, but it's not going to be good. <laughs> it's not going to be good. I mean, I'm still going to play. Okay. But it's going to be miserable and everybody's yeah. not going to have a good time seeing me. So <laughs> yeah. I start, I started really intensive chiropractic therapy three times a week for the first Oof. year. Um, and it was kind of, I, I've always played larger guitars that are just a little too big for me. So I've always mm -hmm. had to compensate, drop the left shoulder or push this shoulder out yeah. to get over it. And you get that knot in which they refer to as dreadnought shoulder, oddly enough. <laughs> Um, but it, it created a, a pretty significant imbalance in my spine because um, I've been doing this over half my life at this point. Mm -hmm. So for a good while, I thought, well, you know what? I'll take the ease off and I'll do a lot of these like morning brunch gigs. I'll play them seated. Yeah. And oddly enough, that's what did the most damage because yeah, when it's you're easy to have bad posture when you're sitting and playing. Yeah, you put one foot on top of the other to get yeah, the instrument just, just like, right. Yeah, slouch. exactly. <laughs> um, and that's that's what really caused it. So oh. I, I started talking with Jeff. I was like, you know, what if there was a way that we could create something that is just a little more ergonomic for the player that, you know, takes away from a lot of this stress? I mean, mm -hmm. yes, an arm bevel helps a little bit, but how could you actually get the instrument to just really lay into you. So you don't yeah. have to do funny things like turkey neck out to try to see the fretboard over the up bow mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's where we kind of came up with this, this concept here. And mm -hmm. I, I, I've played several of the Manzer wedge guitars. Linda Manzer is a genius for this idea. But what I noticed about them was it's mainly for seated playing. 
Mm-hmm. And my chiropractor pretty much said, stop playing seated. <laughs> so I thought about it and I, I, I stood with some of them and they did something weird when you, st- I, I like to play in this type of position on the stage. Mm-hmm. So I thought about it and I said, well, what if the wedge were on that plane? So we made this the thinnest part of the instrument. Mm-hmm. And then this part, the thickest part of the instrument. So it's got this asymmetrical wedge to it that just lays against you so perfectly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as a result, since this side does eat some of that wedge, this is thinner as well. Um, So adding the arm bevel to it just made it feel like a slimline guitar. But I mean, it's 4.7 deep over here. So it's still got the the volumetric airspace of a a deep body guitar. But all the benefit of feeling like you're playing a thin line acoustic. Yeah. So it it really was a a really cool thought and challenge. Um, I kept explaining it to him over the phone, and I, I'm I'm a bit of a night thinker. So I'd be <laughs> I'd be I'd be laying in bed at three and four in the morning, and I I just screenshot some of his guitars and start sketching and going well. I, I literally drew out the exact measurements and dimensions for a whole rim set of how it could be profiled. And he just called me the next morning and was like, can you get up here? And I, <laughs> I, I ended up hopping on a flight the next day and mm-hmm. flew up there and I literally drew it out on cardboard and we <laughs> taped it to the side of a guitar and he just walked right over to the bandsaw without even second thought and just ran it right through and went, let's see how this works. Wow. <laughs> um, so I, I really commend Jeff for how adventurous he is. He is, yeah. Um, he's just, he's such a fun person. Yeah. And he really, he knocked out of the park with his guitar built. Yeah. Um, and he, what was most honoring is he, he listened to a lot of the things that I, I had suggested. And, you know, of course, if it was a bad idea, he's obviously not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I trust I trust him on that as you should you should always trust the luthier that you work with yeah um if if they don't think it's a good idea don't push them to do it yeah so I think the only thing that I really pushed him to do that he hadn't really done much of was doing color and I just had I just had it a minute ago. I guess I, I hid it for myself, but I have a cutoff of the blue um, veneer that I pushed him to kind of do because he'd never really done any color. And I, mm-hmm. I thought, how cool would it be if we just got rid of all the white purfling and did blue for everything? Yeah. Um, and he just stopped and went, I don't really do color. And I went... <laughs> But if we pick the right woods to go with it, you're the color guy. And he went, yeah. you know, now that I think about it, Coco Bolo really goes good with yeah. blue. And I said, I love Coco. What if we were to do that all together? And he just jumped right on it uh, without a second thought. Mm-hmm. And it looks so beautiful together. It really does. Like. Yeah, you blue is not like an obvious choice for guitars. You know, it's reds and browns, et cetera. But it, I think because of the fact that it is that co- contrasting, but it's not like, yeah, it's not super out there or anything like that. But it, it just, it so beautifully sets off that Coca Bolo and the spruce well, and just ties everything together so nicely. And it's not like gigantic no. binding pieces either. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just those just micro purfling pieces. Exactly. Just to mm-hmm. kind of, almost draw your eye more to the beauty of the red of the cocoa. Yeah. Um, it, it suddenly makes you realize other hues that are present. Um, mm-hmm. And Jeff will be much better explaining the color science behind it because <laughs> I'm not the color guy. Yeah. Jeff is the color guy. <laughs> yeah. Literally. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, man, so. So yeah, before we we go much further on, on with with this, or, unless there's anything else you want to say specifically about your experience with Jeff, like I'd like to kind of backtrack a little bit and talk more about how you kind of got into 
no, like knowing the mechanics of guitar and being kind of in this place where you could say, here's what I'm thinking in this very specific design. Like, have you taken like repair classes, building classes at all? Have you just dug through the books and tutorials and stuff like that? I've, I've done a lot of reading and research mm -hmm. over the years, uh, but it kind of started with guitar issues, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, yeah, just troubleshooting things. Just troubleshooting things. Um, first, it started with setups. I mean, I, I was playing so often, the guitars are going to change. They're going to do things. They're going to misbehave. <laughs> and you got to figure out how to get them back in line. Yeah. Um, so I... I always tried to pay attention to what the instrument wanted. So I, I would always look at them. I'd always inspect them and figure out, you know, if something's going wrong, if I hear something funny, any rattles, buzzing, anything like that. Um, but there's only so much you can do with certain instruments. For many years, I was a Maiden guitar player, mm -hmm. just like Tommy. Um, mm -hmm. And they're they're workhorses they're they're built tough so it was a great road worthy guitar um and all i really had to worry about with it was the frets and mm -hmm. unfortunately the the nickel frets wore through very quickly so <laughs> i i had went to a luthier and had stainless steel put on it mm -hmm. and he kind of let me sit there through the process and I, I'm very, very in tune with how lucky I am. <laughs> I'm so fortunate to be around so many wonderful people. So in this area, we have this guy, Kenny Marshall, and he's kind of known around the world as the fret doctor. Okay. And Phil Keege sends all his stuff mm. to Kenny to have it set up. Gotcha. And he, he was in my hometown. So he Convenient. sat... <laughs> He let me sit through the whole process and kind of show me and, you know, explain how to do certain maintenance things. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously some things are going to change. Get yourself some fret leveling tools, recrowning tools, things like that, just to keep up with maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, unless I really wanted to constantly book time with him. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm a gigging musician. That gets expensive fast. Yeah. So, you know, you either deal with it or learn how to do maintenance yourself. So, um, but then I kind of started, I got sick of a certain pattern because of the sound of the maiden and its pickup system. Of course, I, I was a big Tommy fan. So I, I had the same gear. I had the same amp. I had the same reverb units, all that stuff. And I'd be playing at festivals or things like that. And I'd watch people run around the corner and go, oh, is that Tommy? And the second they see me, they go, that's not Tommy, but it sounds like, <laughs> and they just walk away. I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> this, this sound has plagued me. So I, I wanted huh. to move away from it and create my own sound. Yeah. So yet again, I was very fortunate of my area. Kim Person is the engineer that recorded Tommy's The Mystery endless road all his live dvds mm -hmm. uh and she has worked with amy lou harris on building her pedal board and pam rose and working with live sound is something that she really dives okay. deep into along with the engineering side of recording mm -hmm. um so i had just recorded my album and i kind of explained these issues and she goes well you got to get a better guitar and then once once you do we'll figure out what to do from there i can be a great source of different pickups and things mm -hmm. like that um so i i went out to winfield um and actually ended up winning and got a larave um and the larave was the closest thing to a handmade guitar that i had experienced at that point mm -hmm. um which was just the perfect canvas so but it was it was a gigantic guitar. It was the LV mm -hmm. LV10, and they're big. I mean, they're they're twenty one point two five inches long, so that's like it's bigger than a dreadnought. It was Oof. a full sixteen inches across. So yeah, I, I, I worked yeah I worked with that for a while, and it just it was killing me to play it on the stage because it mm -hmm. just it felt like 
like holding a coffee table. Yeah. It sounded massive, <laughs> but it just, it was too big for a little person like me. So, yeah. um, luckily I went out to another competition and I won another guitar, um, a Chinese guitar by Mason. And they're kind of like OM hybrids. They're, they're okay. smaller. So I switched to using that for the stage. Um, but the one that I received, it was their first Adirondack top. And they were being really conservative after seeing some of the percussive fingerstyle players really just beat the crap out of them. And they were all cracked up. So they built mine like twice as thick and the braces were just... <laughs> way too heavy on it so uh -huh. i i actually called ryan gerber and we talked extensively about it and you know he encouraged me he said get in there i said all right i'm doing it so <laughs> I, I i actually i made a little handheld jig for shaving the braces mm -hmm. and and pro reprofiling them on the inside and i just I take off a little bit here, take off a little bit there, you know, restring it up, see how it was doing, see if it was terrible, if I've made <laughs> a really big mistake. Um, but, you know, just don't overdo it. And yeah. it suddenly, it started to dawn on me, I really enjoy these subtle changes that I'm making and that I'm bringing this instrument to life. Mm -hmm. So it before it was, it just sounded like a cardboard box and then suddenly it it started to have a voice. Yeah. So um I started to get really into what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. What how the energy actually transfers to the top board and what makes them sound a little different from each other. What mm -hmm. you you know not just the energy transferring to the top but then what the purposes of the tone bars and the different bracing and those essential things behind both the tension loading, but also tone generating. So it's just like gearheads, guys that, that really love specific engines like V8s. Well, a Ford V8 and a Chevy V8 sound completely different, even though they're still a V8. But the firing order really dictates what makes them sound different from each other. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of thing with, with guitars. They are their own machines. They're their yeah. own engines. They're just organic machines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, that kind of gets into like the factory versus luthier, luthier, sorry, luthier built instrument. Like that's kind of the crux of it right there is like there's a factory instrument. It's it's basically built in a way that's going to be structurally sound, but the luthier who's sitting there and carefully shaving those braces, carefully like tuning the top, that's what really makes that difference. And that's why exactly. that is so great. Like that's why that's going to open up so much for you because you have that person doing that for you or, you know, whether or not you do that for yourself and, you know, take that next step or not, like that's what, that's what's so magical about a luthier bill instrument. It adds the missing piece of personality that mm -hmm. each instrument has the potential to have yeah so that's something that i've really grown to respect about each of these luthiers is they they have their own voice they're able to mm -hmm. coax certain things out of the the instruments that they build and not just that if someone wants a specific thing, like I really, I want something that's got a, a really big bass on it, or I want something that's very harmonically rich, mm -hmm. they're able to do subtle changes to make those things come out. Mm -hmm. So I've started trying, well, especially since I, I'm fortunate enough to get 20, 30 guitars in my hands by these different luthiers, um, the sound ports have become my best friend. <laughs> Yeah. Because I can take a peek. I can yeah. look inside and go, what on earth did yeah. you do? All How right. did you make <laughs> this thing sound so good? Yeah. So um, I've just, I've become obsessed with this industry and really trying to be in tune with each instrument and go, okay, what are your boundaries? Mm -hmm. I, I want to I wanna push you to the, the brick wall and then just step back. Know, mm -hmm. know what it's able to do 
and highlight those abilities of each different instrument that way so people understand what they have to offer out of them Mm -hmm. um because you don't always know Mm -hmm. i mean until you get your hands on like a a buendia or a kraut and you feel that rumbling bass when you hit that six string you didn't know that was possible yeah so that's that's something that i try to try to explain in in the demos that i do but also encourage people to pick it up yeah don't just take my word for it (laughs) experience it yourself and if you if you don't like it most all these places have return policies yeah (laughs) (laughs) but you probably won't end up returning it you're you're probably going to fall in love with these things as long as the specs are what you want but if they aren't that's a good thing you can call up these luthiers and go i want that but can you do this for me Mm -hmm. my hand is my hand doesn't work like that or Mm -hmm. my my, i've got arthritis here can you make this edge of the fretboard or the the cheeks take them in a little bit so i can wrap Mm -hmm. my thumb easier or some people really love v profiles i don't know why i'm not one of those people (laughs) but some people really do and it's usually the 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 people that put the guitar on the right hip and Mm -hmm. then hold it with a thumb over i get that that might really do it for you um (laughs) but and you can get that Mm -hmm. just ask um but that's that's the cool thing about working with a, a personal luthier is you have the ability to get just about everything in the kitchen sink mm-hmm. you know yeah yeah that's something yeah one of the questions i was going to ask you is like it, it's it's kind of tough being in the position that we're in sometimes where we're trying to like put words to ineffable qualities of tone or the experience of playing an instrument. And at the end of the day, like all I, all I ever want to say to people is like, you really have to just try things yourself. And, and yeah, there are return policies, just, you know, make sure you like the sound from a basic, you know, video and like the specs match what you need, but like, you got to just take the plunge sometimes. Cause I, I just, yeah, I was kind of curious to see if there's anything that you try to sort of touch on in, in the, the videos to really give people that experience as much as you can from afar because it it is hard it is but there is something that i've kind of realized and what i try to vocalize to people Mm -hmm. is well they're they're used to hearing people vocalize so Mm -hmm. how do you equate that to an instrument and the sound of it it's easy we speak they speak Mm -hmm. we speak using vowels so do they (laughs) <laughs> and that's the thing that I kind of, it dawned on me one day. I, I kept hearing all of these fairly ethereal sounding guitars. And the, the, I just kept saying, there's too much of an awe sound to it. And then it mm-hmm. dawned on me, oh, oh, <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Some of them have a, a very different vowel texture to them. Some of them really want to go, oh, or awe. That's and then good. some of them really have more of an err yeah and and to me i'm drawn a little towards the err spectrum (laughs) and the reason for it is that's usually the ones that have more lower mid-range to them Mm -hmm. where a lot of these instruments that have kind of a awe or cathedral-like sound they're usually dalbergias they're Mm -hmm. usually things that are are rosewood based and kind of have a bit of a mid-scoop to them And that's kind of what creates that sound. Mm -hmm. So um, that's come in handy. It's given me confidence in telling them. (laughs) Hopefully it makes sense to people. If not, I'm going to keep saying it anyways, because I think it it makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a great way to sort of translate like, yeah, that sound as much as possible. And yeah, using language, because that is those qualities are, you know, we use those qualities in singing. And like, if somebody has too much of that, like, all kind of presence but not enough of a like a articulation or a bite sometimes the like the clarity gets lost a little bit and you need a little exactly. bit of bite and so you look for that in singing so why wouldn't you look for that in a an instrument as well it tra- that totally translates over well it also kind of it depends on what you're doing mm-hmm. it depends on the music that you're playing to be yeah. honest because sometimes 
those really ethereal, awe-sounding instruments work very well for certain styles of music. Yeah, that's true. But if if they're really busy things, sometimes things get missed. They yeah. get buried under each other. But it does allow for certain values of the the notes to come forward. A lot of times on those very awesome instruments, the trebles are very forward on them. Mm -hmm. And the harmonics are usually really great too. Um, But I like for something to have a little more responsive voice across the spectrum. So having something that's a little more even helps me articulate my own music. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to overwork or push the instrument too hard to do an app just do something or ask of the instrument what it's not capable of Mm -hmm. so but i didn't realize that until i got my hands on some of these things Mm -hmm. i would just play what i play i write how i write yeah and if it sounded bad i just tossed it away but then (laughs) i realized that oh wait that song sounds really good on this type of guitar so um Suddenly, I have too many guitars. <laughs> no, no, I take that back. There's no such thing. One can never have too many guitars. As long as you're happy with all the children you yeah. have, keep them. Yeah. You have the space and the money. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the money, but I, I currently have the space. They're investments. So, exactly. <laughs> you just take good care of them. And if That's you true. take care of them, they'll take care of you when you're old and you need to <laughs> rely on your children to help out. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many guitars do you have at this point? Oh, um, I don't know how to equate that. I guess I could count them um or maybe how many do you actively use on like a regular basis um probably about eight of them oh wow Uh, i don't i don't gig with all of them but they all kind of have their own purpose Mm -hmm. um i've i've got two really nice larvae over there on the wall um Mm -hmm. my first one was my first custom 12 fret c which is still a really big guitar Mm -hmm. and that's what i won one of the competitions with but Right after I won the competition, they called me and said, we want to make a signature model for you. And then a few days later, that guitar ended up being the Tommy Emanuel signature model. I went, <laughs> oh, well, we can't do that one. <laughs> so we actually, I, I explained to them, it's still a little big. So we actually mm-hmm. released the CS, which is oh, okay. literally an exact shrink of an just... inch all the way around. Um, And both of those are just phenomenal sounding instruments for them to be factory guitars. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, Larave is just a little different than most factory made. They're they're still very hands on. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, even Jean still to this day, he hand bends every single Florentine for all of them. He's the only one that does that. Wow. So I know, isn't that crazy? (laughs) So, and um then of course in that same vein i've got a get a day young over there mm. which was a larve apprentice mm-hmm. um and that's got a wonderful voice of his own um i've got a morris from japan which is a double x top um sounds it was my first kind of more modern sounding instrument mm-hmm. but stephen bennett had always played them so he actually got me hooked up with them and i've had that for I think 20 years now. Oh, wow. Um, and it, it's, it sounds awesome. But uh, at this point, they've all kind of retired to the wall where <laughs> I play them at home. Mm-hmm. The only instrument that I really care to play out and about at this point is the Jewett. Mm-hmm. It, um, it kind of does what all of them can do. And mm-hmm. it's, it's more comfortable all around. Um, Mm -hmm. I I really enjoy the ergonomic features that we were able to kind of come up with and what he was able to really nail on it. It's beautiful. I like Mm -hmm. I like pretty guitars. (laughs) Um, And also it's a hybrid short scale. um, And that's a huge thing to Mr. Ryan Gerber. Mm. He actually he made this. Yeah, he made this fretboard for us on his CNC. He'd been doing a very 
interesting thing with the sizing of his instruments, he feels that the scale length kind of goes with the size of them. So his mm -hmm. RL-16 is a full 25.5. Mm -hmm. And then the 15.5 was 25.25. And then his RL-15, which is now discontinued, so the RL-14.5 was the full short scale 25. Mm -hmm. And I, I've i got a heavy hand. I've, I'm energetic. I like I like to create music that's a little out there <laughs> some of some of it's percussive but um i like to do lots of different tunings mm -hmm. uh most of my songs are in a different tuning from each other so i i was a little weary of going all the way short scale yeah so i went with the goldilocks method let's just go right in the middle <laughs> um so it ryan was just very gracious enough to to help us out there and mm -hmm. Yet again, we were lucky enough that Jeff lives like an hour from Ryan yeah. Gerber. So it was like, hey, come on over. <laughs> uh, and and is, as much as you'd think that Ryan wouldn't be the most friendly, open guy in the world, he is one of the nicest, so nice. most intelligent yeah. people I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I have so much gratitude for that man. Um, that and also he he let me stay with him. So Aww. um I, I got to really get a, a sneak peek in his shop and mm. get to ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. Um I, I'm very inquisitive about just about anything I get into. I just I wanna know about it. Why? Mm -hmm. How do you do this? And do you have a reason behind it, or is it just something you instinctively know to do? Mm -hmm. So it was really lovely to to get those opportunities to see the way that a lot of different people work and see mm -hmm. what makes their instruments tick. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much variation with, yeah, the approaches, the backgrounds and everything. And I mean, both Ryan and Jeff ha are very self-taught, which is just kind of mind boggling, yeah. like for them to both be as good as they are. But obviously it comes from that just like constant drive to, to find, to, find the next thing and to, and to keep pushing things forward. So, um, yeah, that's, they're just like a dream team. <laughs> well, and it, it is really interesting to see the difference between them where yeah. Ryan works out of the, his basement shop yeah. in this very closed small, well, he's got a, he's got a larger place now. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but he, he was really great at coming up with storage methods and procedures okay i need to do these things together at this time and then all that stuff would go away and he'd work on the next part of oh, okay. that batch of instruments where jeff is on the other side of the spectrum jeff's <laughs> got this like so much space <laughs> and it's like you know we, we could build 20 guitars at once <laughs> um it just kind of depends on what he wants to do at that time or what's yeah. you know what's on order or what he has in in concept to build um, while still balancing the whole trans tent side mm -hmm. of the world. Yeah. Cause you know, he's really in demand for that stuff. Everybody still needs to make their instruments look pretty. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool to, to see how these different personalities end up translating into how they work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure.
Well, going back a little bit to your past, um, so you started on electric guitar. I don't think I realized that. Do you still play electric at all, or is it pretty much just acoustic? Never since. Never. <laughs> no, no, I, I take that back. Um, I did get hired to play in a country band for a little bit, oh. but I didn't. I didn't have an electric guitar oh, okay. anymore, mm -hmm. so it was the band's gear. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I got, I got to jam out on a David Gilmore Strat for a bit, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but. It was it was mainly just mainstream country bars and mm -hmm. heavy beer vibes. Um, <laughs> I mean, some of the venues just smelled like the inside of a keg. Um, <laughs> I just <laughs> it's much fun and enjoyment as it was to to live that side of the rock star life. Um, I, I really fell in love with the acoustic stuff and just pivoted completely. Mm -hmm. But when I started, it was. It was Metallica and Pantera and all the different years of Ozzy because mm -hmm. each each guitarist was different. So yeah. and, and I my my uncles and, and friends and all they were all metalheads. So mm. it was it was interesting to try to convince them why they should come and listen to the acoustic side of things. Once <laughs> once I got bit by that bug. Yeah, I was I was infected. I, I <laughs> wanted nothing to do with the electric guitar world anymore, and mm -hmm. it it was an interesting thing. Um, I just I enjoy the way that the instrument feels. So, um, but these days with modern electronics, you know, you can still you can utilize those things to your advantage as even a, an acoustic player. Um, yeah. You can use all the fun effects and you know all that stuff even some people are using distortion <laughs> on on their stuff like mike dawes and mm -hmm. alexander yeah. misco you know yeah i feel like if in a lot used... of ways there's been a lot of like metal inspiration that's got been brought into the acoustic world in that sense yes so. it, it it can translate if done tastefully mm -hmm. yeah uh, and and they <laughs> they do it right mm -hmm. um so I I have so much respect for this community of players and they're just it it just keeps growing. Yeah. Um the internet has been a very wonderful thing for people to communicate with each other, check out new ideas, you know, figure out, oh, I saw you do this. How are you achieving that? And yeah, it, it's really kind of blossomed this camaraderie that wasn't quite there before. Mm -hmm. Um I'm I'm finally getting on board. I've always sucked with the internet. I will be blatantly, <laughs> blatantly honest with all of that. I I suck at sitting down and typing out posts or yeah. posting a video of myself. So the majority of the content that's out there is something that someone else has either recorded of me or stuff like that. Just because I don't, I don't know. I I'm not always the best about talking about myself so when i sit down and i yeah. start doing it i'm like what are you doing go play guitar <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, i just i get distracted and i go play yeah yeah um so i i i i've always been of the thought i'd much rather show up and play mm -hmm. and let that speak rather than me telling you how good i am yeah um so that that's worked well for me in the acoustic world. Mm -hmm. I, as far as my previous past and electric guitar, that was just getting my feet wet and learning the fretboard as yeah. far as I'm concerned. I, I never really had the interest in pursuing it as a career when I was playing electric guitar. Okay. Um, and really what gave me my sense of music knowledge wasn't really the guitar. Mm -hmm. Um, I was actually a classical trumpet player all throughout school. Oh, wow. So, um, I, I know how to read music. I know theory and I, I know the importance of orchestral pieces and what the role is of each instrument and, yeah. in, in becoming the sound. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't, I didn't know how to use that when I was playing electric it for some reason just didn't click in my brain that 
they were both musical instruments. Mm -hmm. You can do both of these things and utilize some of that knowledge towards this instrument. Because I was just playing Metallica. <laughs> you know, I was just playing riffs and things yeah. like that. But suddenly, once I switched to the acoustic instrument, it's like my brain just finally woke up and went, oh, you can write things now. You can you can create music all on this instrument with mm -hmm. finger style guitar and utilize some of those things that you learned in being in orchestras and symphonies and things like that, where mm -hmm. each part kind of goes back and forth. You can write yeah. lower parts, you can write higher parts and create these compositions that have a little more depth to them mm -hmm. not just simple guitar ditties but yeah um so when i when i'm entering the writing space i'm very much thinking about it in what would a full orchestra do what mm -hmm. how would they create or approach this piece and layering and things like that yeah that's what's so cool about fingerstyle guitars i mean and guitar in general is like kind of a generalist instrument in that you've got bass, you've got treble, you've got mids, you can, you can have multiple voices going at the same time, but finger style especially is where that really is the thing. And so, yeah, having a classical music background where you're used to having multiple voices or like a choral background where you, you're used, you're used to sort of understanding the music in terms of like bass, tenor, alto soprano or something like that. And realizing like, Oh, you can adapt that to one instrument. That's exactly. Crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, all it takes is, you know, commanding the muscle memory, mm -hmm. learning learning those simple techniques of isolation of each different types of patterns with the right hand, and then getting this hand to talk with this hand and mm -hmm. be friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can really end up coming up with some things that help you step aside from yourself mm -hmm. um, that are pretty much just their ego death, you mm -hmm. know, they, it's no longer about you. It's about the piece of music. And that's mm -hmm. something that I've always really aimed for is creating something that transcends me feeling about me. Mm. I suddenly, I lose, I lose that want of thinking about myself and I, I have self accountability of this thing that I've just created. It is now my baby <laughs> and I, I want to play it with as much true intention as possible. Um, mm. So that, that's kept me really focused and driven over the years. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of that is also because of influence from people like Stephen Bennett. He's mm -hmm. He's been a mentor for me for many years and he, he would always let me know, you know, when you go to write something or you play something, you be intentful about it. And if you decide to record something, that is a historical document. It is yeah. now set from here forth. <laughs> so if you record it, record it right. Mm. <laughs> so for those of you who are thinking about doing things or recording from <laughs> home, you can, or you can get a really good engineer that will make sure that you yeah. are able to do, and they'll, a lot of times working with a great engineer, they'll pull things out of you and find ways of talking to you or bringing the most out of your playing capability. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I was very, yet again, fortunate where I lived. Mm -hmm. um, Kim Person is, less than an hour away from me. Um, so it was really great to, to get to record my album with her and learn so much about frequencies. Mm -hmm. She is just a wealth of knowledge in that industry and she's a great player herself. So mm -hmm. she, she's, got, she's got Kathy Wingertz, you know, she's, she's got all the nice guitars. She's got harp <laughs> guitars too. Um, <laughs> So she she knows what to listen for, not just that, but she can regurgitate what these things mean. Mm -hmm. So she was able to really teach me 
uh, the importance of certain EQ things that have translated to my live sound. Mm. Um, so that it's made me so much more comfortable as a professional performer. That's great. Um, so I've, I've built this pedal rig where I pretty much, I'm able to do everything from the board and I just send out XLR feeds to the front of house. And sometimes they hate me because <laughs> they want all the control. Yeah. But most of the time they're like, that was the easiest sound job ever. <laughs> all I did was <laughs> turn you on and it, it worked per perfectly as intended or <laughs> as designed. Yeah. So um, finding relationships like that isn't always common. And yet yeah. again, I'm, I'm just fortunate in where I'm at, the people that I know. Um, so I encourage everybody to try to build those kind of relationships with people around you. Mm -hmm. And with the internet these days, they don't even have to be around you. Yeah. You can just spark up conversations with different different engineers or sound men or luthiers mm -hmm. and let them know what you're looking for, what you're confused about. And knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. it, it empowers you. It makes you feel more comfortable. And it allows me to get on the stage or in a chair in front of a camera doing a demo and feel completely at home. Mm -hmm. I just sit down and go, you know what? It's me and that guitar right now. I don't need to think about anything else. And that's and so freeing. <laughs> it It's transcendent. Mm -hmm. um, and it anybody can do it. Everybody can do it. If they just really tap into being in tune with the instrument and themselves and that relationship and just go, you know what? It's time to shut off and get to work. Um, I know not everybody has that luxury. A lot of people have real jobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, as people like to remind me, oh, I have a real job. <laughs> um, well, I have a real hard job. <laughs> um, so being a musician, it doesn't just translate to what you do sitting down with the instrument. It is, it is preparing each each time that you intend to sit down, you got to make sure that you've stretched, you've taken care of yourself, you've eaten properly, yeah. you've, you've done all the things leading up to that moment. <laughs> uh, if not, you have failed as the musician for the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. There's so, I mean, there's so much sort of unseen work that goes into playing music full time and even get it, even just not even the sort of the Zen esoteric sides of just sort of preparing your mind and body for things, but just, yeah, the day-to-day the -day stuff that people don't necessarily appreciate, but yeah, that taking care of yourself side of it is so important. And so, so easy to overlook. I feel like I've been overlooking it for the past couple of years, a lot, to be honest, but this is a good reminder to, yeah, to center yourself. Well, and, you know, <laughs> when, when you are, when you find that right balance or homeostasis or however you want to quantify it, mm -hmm. suddenly you write better, you play better, yeah. you, you achieve more, you win constantly mm -hmm. and it feels that way. So um, that's what I am always in the mindset of doing, even if I don't always achieve it. <laughs> <laughs> It's intention yeah. that matters, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and accepting that some days it's not always going to come as easily or, or at all, but it's, it's those days when you do achieve that, where you're like, all right, it was all worth it. Well, and sometimes you just sit down with the right guitar mm -hmm. or, and, or and a new, a new guitar. In. Yeah. It, yeah. It just, it immediately snaps you mm -hmm. out of a weird headspace and gets you right on track. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, this luthier world of things has done that many times for me mm -hmm. where I feel like I'm just playing like garbage that day. And then suddenly I sit down with a really fantastic instrument and I listen to it and I go, okay, today's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> suddenly nothing else matters. 
not to pull out a Metallica quote, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, guitars have a way of of making you unusually blissful mm-hmm. without knowing why. Um, so that's that's where I'm very lucky as as someone who plays guitar for a living because mm-hmm. I constantly am able to tune into the fact that I'm suddenly happy. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of people ask me all the time, why are you always so happy? <laughs> it's because I play guitar for a living. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't mean that I, you know, succeed in life, but it makes me feel like I do. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and that's in your contributing to community and you're developing those relationships. And that's all such a big part of it too. And what makes us feel good as humans. And so, yeah, I mean, even if there's a day where you don't feel like you really knock it out of the park, you're still, that's still always a part of it in the background. And so, yeah, playing guitar is awesome. (laughs) Well, and then like you said, community, Um, Mm -hmm. being able to help others see that too. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always really enjoyed that side of things and really digging deep into how I approach things. So um, I've done lots of master classes and clinics and things like that. But what I've also really enjoyed is sitting down and doing the hands-on approach with people. Um, Mm -hmm. And probably about eight years ago, I was doing a concert and this kid came up to me at the end and said, you know, I saw Andy McKee playing a harp guitar on YouTube and then your video came up next and I realized, whoa, you're from my hometown. So he came out to the concert just because of that. And Mm -hmm. he sat down with my harp guitar and started playing something on it. I just went, okay. I like where this is headed. And he just (laughs) looked over me and said, you know, would you consider playing some lead guitar with me. I'm a singer songwriter and I, I, I'd love to, you know, work with you. And I, I said, you know, I could use work. There's not always a whole lot of work for instrumental guitar. Um, Mm -hmm. I've, I've had to really carve out a way in this area. Um, so I started doing gigs with this, this guy, Dustin Furlow. And we just, it went from, agreeing to do it to five, six nights a week. And I was traveling so much uh, back and forth across my region, which is surrounded by tunnels. So there was a lot of traffic that I sat in at (laughs) three in the morning where the tunnel suddenly is closed for an hour or two. And I don't get home until like six in the morning from a bar gig. Um, So we decided, you know, it'd be best if we moved in together that Mm -hmm. way so that we can commute to these gigs together. And it it really allowed me to sit down with him and show him just about everything that I, I know about the instruments and mm-hmm. how I approach phrasing, theory, um, even the, the way to attack the strings. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just, he was like a sponge. He just soaked it up so quick but it was it was so much enjoyment for me to do that and then watch someone just suddenly just rise and continue to to excel with it and yeah he's he's one of my favorite people to to perform with and play with because we've been playing together and been friends for so long that that translates in the music that we're able to create with each other. So, yeah. and, and now, I mean, he's, he's just at such a great level that um, we can play some of my really hard pieces together. Yeah. And, and it, it's so much fun because I, since I do always kind of approach things in that kind of symphonic mindset, a lot of times, even after I've written something, I'm writing a, a harmony piece to it that never gets to get, played <laughs> so because no one around me is ever really yeah they're never really up to that challenge and dustin has really come to that and went i want to learn that one i want to i want to do a second part on that one and it ends up coming out as really really special music so 
um, that, and he's just such an amazing singer. Yeah. Yeah. He's, um, he's so talented. He, he really is. It, the lyrics that he writes, the music mm -hmm. that he writes with it. I, I really enjoy stepping into that mindset with him and mm -hmm. creating things out of the singer song or writer kind of world, but that have the finger style approach to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with, you know, gigs don't always pay a whole lot. So <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we've pretty much gotten rid of drummers and bass players and it's just the duo. So mm -hmm. um, I, with modern finger style and technology, I've pretty much built my rig to have a kick drum and I use oh, octave yeah. dividers. So we have, we have our bass player, yeah. we have our drummer, uh, and we're pretty much able to create the sound of a band mm -hmm. in, in a room with just two people. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a really wonderful partnership that yeah. is, has kind of blossomed and Oddly enough, he's the one that introduced me to Cedar Rock. Yeah, um, yeah. Because he got he got obsessed with Beneteau guitars and got on acoustic guitar for him and was buying, selling, buying, selling. And <laughs> I'm over here just like, what are you doing? That's, you're just <laughs> you're just you're too indecisive. Just keep a guitar. But then I <laughs> I suddenly I suddenly got it. I, I was I was the <laughs> ignorant one. And once I got my hands on these things, I went, oh, this is a different creature. Mm. This is this isn't quite like any guitar that I had ever played. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up uh, when I went out to Arkansas for the Fingerstyle Collective competition, um, Dustin actually had told the owner of Cedar Rock, hey, go out to Arkansas. My buddy's Matt is going you got to see this guy. And that's, that's where I ended up meeting Alan Drake. And okay. he, he's so much fun. <laughs> he, he's a good old country boy from Indiana and a farmer. <laughs> uh, he owns a gigantic, like 250 acre farm. Wow. Um, I, I know it's, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. Um, but is the guitar he, store on the farm? <laughs> it is. Oh, wow. It is. <laughs> so you, you actually, when you go out there, you actually get to see like lots of fields. <laughs> so, and it's, it's quite, it's quite a lovely place to go. And mm -hmm. uh, actually the first couple of times I went, Ryan Gerber came and stayed with me. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really where I, I got to know him. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a, it's a cool world of friends that I've suddenly found myself surrounded with yeah um and it it's it's just because i was willing to reach out to people and they were willing to be friendly mm -hmm. um there's there's too much closedness in the world today and people are sometimes afraid to talk to each other and mm -hmm. i'm not a typer i'm not <laughs> much of that i i don't i don't text a whole lot i love to just pick up the phone and talk so mm -hmm. that that's where i've i've been fortunate enough to find the right people to talk to mm -hmm. or at least convince myself call that person talk <laughs> to that person see what happens yeah um be adventurous <laughs> <laughs> so not yeah. just with music but with friendships because <laughs> you, you never know what can blossom out of it's knowing true. knowing each other yeah so, yeah. And like the Luthier community is just so, so collaborative and so open and everybody seems really to is. always be trading ideas with each other. And, and I think that that's definitely true with music too. Maybe some scenes are more so than others. And, but it, it does seem like s sort of different kind of genres can get boxed off a little bit, but with guitar being such a, an instrument that, tra that transfers over so many different genres, so many different styles, you can kind of be a part of a lot of little worlds like that. And so you can be part of jazz, you can be a part of rock, you can be a part of really specific acoustic finger style music that involves percussive techniques and, and all sorts of, you know, dazzling techniques and things like that, or you can be into like folk or whatever, and it, it all can, it all meshes together and it's all great music and it's all fun to be a part of. Well, I want to be a part of them all. <laughs> I'm too ADD to just do one thing. I'm like, yeah. no, now let's do some jazz. Now let's do yeah. some folk. Let's go sample that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, 
I, I've quite enjoyed how open a lot of these people are. But, I mean, really, reality is with the internet these days, the moment you hit post, someone else is going to copy it. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that's okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, you know, Nothing's original. Because nothing is really original anymore. It's all influenced by something. So mm -hmm. even though I write the music that I write, it's all inspired or influenced mm -hmm. by something else. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, my favorite that, part of being a part of musical communities is acknowledging that and being like, yeah, so-and-so sang this song and that really inspired me to either sing the same song and do something a little bit different with it or make up a different melody that's kind of influenced by that. And that's, that's, I love that. It's, that's so much fun to get to have that experience and to connect with people by being, by liking the same song or liking the same things. I completely agree. Or taking a melody from that song and the mm -hmm. chords from that song and just <laughs> <laughs> putting them together. Yeah. Well, this has been so, so much fun to chat with you. And I, I feel like there's a lot of good, like little life nuggets of advice that you've already, already espoused, but just a few like kind of closing questions to ask. Um, Absolutely. What, uh, for people who are looking for that next guitar that they, they will help guide them or like kind of push them further along in their trajectory. How, what are some maybe tips that you might have for folks as, as far as finding that guitar goes? Um, know what it is that you are looking for and don't be afraid to have those conversations, you know? Yeah. Um, sometimes people just get an instrument and deal with the nut width or the string mm -hmm. spacing and find out what works best for you and know what it is that you're trying to achieve on that. Cause, um, for a bit, I thought I wanted something really wide for just purely finger style, but then I realized, oh crap. It's really hard to flat pick on that. Yeah. Because it's just such a wide pattern. <laughs> like, yeah. There's so much to fall between. I feel like I'm stirring an egg beater, you yeah. know, <laughs> trying to get my my patterns. Um, so kind of figure out what it is that you want before you really decide on it, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Um, play a few different things. Go to a store, mm -hmm. you know um check them out figure out what works best for your hands yeah what what body size really works best for you um because a lot of these luthiers they can make a little guitar sound like a big guitar mm -hmm. so yeah. you don't always have to get a super dreadnought to sound big mm -mm. so yeah um make sure that it works for you so that you want to play it as much mm -hmm. as possible and so that you can play it as much as possible mm -hmm. because if you get something that is too cumbersome that hurts you to play you're going to play it for 10 or 15 minutes and then set it down and go yeah that was fun but now i'm i'm in yeah pain. yeah i don't i, I gotta go do something else <laughs> um i don't i don't want to be taken out of that zone so yeah. i i search for something that allows me to zone out and play for as long as my body can handle. So find, find what specs work best for you so that you are comfortable with the instrument. Uh, obviously, if there's certain tone wood combos that light you up the most, um, just because of either the way they attack, their decay on blossoming, or if you want something that's very immediate with tone, um, a lot of these things are conversations you can have with the luthier. Mm -hmm. They will guide you into the tone woods that they think would be best. And then there's people like Kevin Meiderman that just go, doesn't matter. I can yeah. get the sound you want out of anything. <laughs> yeah. It just matters what you think is most pretty. Yeah. Um, which is the next thing. If you have something that you have in mind that is just what you want, if you want you know, quilted mahogany, or if you want Brazilian or things like that, find a luthier that knows how to work well with these things and mm -hmm. go with that. Um, or if you want something really elaborate with inlay, find someone that either does really elaborate inlay or can work with someone 
like Craig Lavin or, mm -hmm. you know, Agawa and Lay or people that are just really stellar artistic with their inlay work. Mm -hmm. um, so it, know what, what it is you want going into it, because if you're indecisive, you might end up not loving it mm -hmm. and ordering something else, which yeah. is okay too, because then there's more guitars in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but then you spend twice as much money. Yeah. And I, I don't always have that luxury to do that. So <laughs> I've learned to be really, really in tune with what it is I need for mm -hmm. that purpose. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully, yeah, that's great hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's yeah, honing in on what you want and being okay with asking for it, like, which I, I think for some of us can be hard to, you know, maybe you don't trust yourself or you feel weird asking for something. If it seems like it's out of the range of a luthier's ability, but as we've been discussing, a lot of luthiers are willing to try new things. So it never hurts to ask. It never hurts to bring it up. Well, and then there's some people that they, they just do what they do mm -hmm. and it's awesome. Yeah. And it works for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. that's why I also say, if you have the ability to go to yeah. some of these places and sit down with the instruments you might yeah. just fall in love with how someone does something yeah and then you don't have to ask for anything different you just go you just, i want i, I want that, that <laughs> but i want it with this wood or i want it with mm -hmm. this spec yeah so things like that mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that's great advice um well as far as sort of developing one's skill, you mentioned that you do master classes. Do you actively teach like lessons online or anything like that? I do. Um, I don't really do beginners, to okay. be honest. Yeah. Because I had I've been so immersed in music for so long, I have forgotten how. I learned my ABCs. It can be hard to like go back and remember how to explain well, the stuff that's so embedded. <laughs> I don't know how to get into someone's head. Yeah. The idea of interval relation. Yeah. If they don't already have a, a basic sense, because most of us are already taught that in elementary school. Mm -hmm. But if they really just never got that. Yeah it's hard for me i usually just end up going way over their head so yeah. a lot of the stuff that i take on are people that already know how to play mm -hmm. and then really want to get from c to z mm -hmm. in in a hurry yeah um and that is something i'm, I'm much better at than going okay today we're going to play a c chord and then the next week they they don't know how to play the C chord anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so today we're also going to learn how we're to play the C back. chord. <laughs> um, I don't, it's not that I don't have the patience for that, but it is, it's frustrating for me to not see them want to really succeed or excel. Yeah. So I, I'm, I am a little choosy in that matter mm -hmm. that I want someone that wants to succeed. Mm -hmm. I want someone that really actually wants to get better. Mm -hmm. And if that's something you're interested in, I'm absolutely willing to show you anything and everything you want to know and how to achieve them. Mm -hmm. As long as I see you actually do some effort mm -hmm. and, and improve. Mm -hmm. But if, if I don't see that, it hurts me. Yeah. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> am yeah. I a bad teacher? No, it's just the bad pupil. Yeah, which it's a some people street. say that there's there's no bad students. Yes, there are because yeah. I've 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 experienced a lot of them that just do not care. They do yeah. not practice. And you're like, why are you doing this? <laughs> why exactly. are you doing it to either of us? <laughs> well, I don't have the time to practice, or I got too busy to do this there's rarely ever a moment in my life where I haven't found an excuse to sit down with the guitar mm -hmm. and explore an idea. Yeah. So those are the type of people that I really aim to work with and help mm -hmm. is the people that they are inquisitive about the instrument. They mm -hmm. want to learn more. They want to succeed more on the fretboard or in the right hand or 
have theory questions on how to write different types of music or mm -hmm. what chords I could go to after this or things like that. Um, that's something that it lights me on fire. And then mm -hmm. I will, I would love to work with anybody that has those kind of views. Awesome. Well, for folks who either, well, I guess for anybody, is there a resource or sort of like a pool of exercises that you tend to point people to for like right hand specifically? Maybe we'll focus on that since finger style. Is there sort of like a resource that you often refer people back to or that you got a lot out of at some point earlier on in your life? Well, um, yes and no. Um, I know that there is there's a lot of really great segovia patterns and things for right hand classical guitar that you can kind of look up and and study um but i've been playing so much and fatigued this hand so much that i actually have a really unique approach to what i call kind of recalibrating mm -hmm. um to your instrument because yet again who knows what instrument you pick up for the day where your arm comes across and meets the strings that mm -hmm. distance isn't always the same so you have to really get in tune with that and there's really no point when you're focusing on those patterns to have this hand in there this yeah. hand is just yeah. to hold it so what i've kind of grown accustomed to doing is putting it in dad gad mm -hmm. and then now all of the patterns that you do are pretty much pleasant to mm -hmm. your neighbor <laughs> And you're not yeah. <laughs> you're not you're not pissing off someone else around you with these constant back and forth things. So yeah. I try to I try to really isolate each finger and command it. And once mm -hmm. I have decided that I'm okay with that, then I'll start on more complex patterns mm -hmm. between, you know, the six string to four string octave, and then move on to the next sets of octaves. Yeah. Fifth string, second string, and then fourth string, first string. Because dad gad just makes it so easy for octaves. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and it also, for your ear, helps you really balance things um, in yeah. both both the attack velocity, that way so that you can get your, your dynamics under control, but mm -hmm. it really helps you associate those muscles with mind muscle connection once you mm -hmm. constantly build that it's just like any other workout that you do when you first go to the gym and you lay down on a bench and you grab the bar and you try to do something you're all <laughs> over the place squiggling but yeah. the more that you calibrate to doing that your muscles just learn this mm -hmm. is how we do it this is how we move mm -hmm. so it's the same thing with the instrument so Every time before I, I do a gig, before I sit down to do demos, I mean, I'm not kidding you. Every mm -hmm. single different guitar that I demo, I sit there and I find the strings. I mm -hmm. find what it feels like to feel the strings. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps me center myself with each different instrument and feel more comfortable achieving things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I that's I need to steal that advice for myself cuz some yeah, it's tempting especially I think for us at, at Carter like we'll be so kind of rushed trying to get okay, we're going to try to get some demos done in a spare moment here and there and so you sit down and you're like, "All right, let me just go ahead and dig into this and see what I can pop out really quickly." And then and you're you like, just miss. "Why is this not coming out?" <laughs> but yeah, having that moment just to like just it doesn't have to be a super long time, 5 10 no. minutes. Just, I'm, just sometimes yeah. even less, you know. Yeah. Yeah. A minute or two uh, yeah. is I'm once you really get comfortable. Yeah. Yes, concentrated focus on. Okay, here is where these strings are. Yeah. Remember where this, where the side feels on your arm. Mm -hmm. That way, so that you you know where to actually attack these strings and mm -hmm. not just completely miss it, <laughs> or end up putting a yeah. giant ding in a very expensive guitar that you cannot afford. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> those are, those are no-nos. So, and you know, I use acrylic nails, so I'm always very intent on being careful with these instruments. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, 
I'm ruthless. I'm, I want to go full throttle at it and yeah. make sure that I can pull as much tone as possible. Mm -hmm. So these are steps that I do leading into it to make sure that I have self accountability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm feeling. And now I know the guitar mm -hmm. and we can vibe together. Yeah. Awesome. Well, last but not least, what's what's coming up next for you? I think you've got a show with Dustin this week, don't you? Uh, we actually, we have shows. Or was it last night? We have shows together every week. Every till, week. Awesome. Yeah. Till the end of the year. We, we do a, an every Thursday residency in Manio, North Carolina. Oh, cool. Um, but oh, in a where few in North weeks, Carolina? Manio. I'm, I'm going to Asheville in a few weeks, so it's not close to Asheville. Oh no, it? that's no, it. it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit far away from that, but it's worth the drive. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's beautiful. It's it's on the Outer Banks, actually. Okay. So, okay. Cool. Um, which is this is technically Roanoke Island, which is mm. the Lost Colony. Yeah, kind the of famous stuff. Roanoke. Exactly. Uh, so come and have a history experience. Yeah. Um, but no, we uh we have the LeConnor Guitar Show coming up in a few weeks. Oh, you're you're both gonna go. Yeah, we're actually awesome. doing the headlining concert Saturday night, but we cool. also have a bunch of different demos for different luthiers and new guitars that I'm very excited to get my hands on. Um, mm -hmm. Like Luca Canteri. Uh, I've, I've never not... tried one of his. Oh, I haven't either. So I haven't even seen one over it, these kind of American shops. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm really excited because um, they, from the demos that I've heard online, they sound phenomenal. They look wonderful. Um, he likes to use blue in the purflings a lot of times, <laughs> which intrigues me. Mm -hmm. um, I love blue. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then, uh, you know, there's, it changes every week with gigs, to be honest. Yeah, um, it's the nature of the I, game. Both of us work with agencies, so they tend to not always put us at the same place every week. So it rotates out, which is good for both the customer base. Um, mm -hmm since we're in a really high volume tourist area, um, it just doesn't stop. There's always yeah, gigs. That's great. Um, yet again, being fortunate of where I live. Yeah, that's awesome. Let me, let me just rub it in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, you're so lucky. <laughs> No, that that is, that is really awesome. And that's just, it's, it's great to be able to acknowledge that and to yeah, just, I mean, and, and we all kind of have that to some extent, you know, um, we all like, we all probably watching this. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. It is, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be blessed with gigs. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I've worked really hard over the years to find myself in this position, mm -hmm. uh, and hard work turns out it actually does pay off. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, it's, you're, you're blessed, but yeah, you, you've put, yeah, you put in that time and you've built that up over time. So. Yes. Well, so hopefully that answers the question of where I'm playing next. Yeah. Any, any summer, <laughs> any of like the summer festivals, like music festivals or just the guitar showcases? Um, yes. Um, actually I'm going to be doing a concert for the Mark Adams school of Luthery, oh, cool. uh, in Indiana mm -hmm. in July, which is going to be really cool big things to Jeff Jewett for actually kind of <laughs> working that out. Um, and then doing a house concert at Cedar Rock, actually, with oh, cool. the legendary Michael Kelsey. Mm -hmm. He's a phenomenal all around musician. Um, one of the most terrifying musicians I've ever shared <laughs> the stage with. Um, and I'm not kidding you. Like, I, wow. I don't feel like I was shaking in my boots when I, I played with Tommy. But when I play with this guy, <laughs> I am terrified. He's just so good at everything. And he oozes this groove and essence that is, it's infectious. Um, nice. I, I had met him at the Woodchoppers Ball events in Ohio. And our energies just really, really mesh well together. So we, we kind of set this up. So that's going to be cool. Awesome. Also in July, um, I'm playing the Argenta concert series in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be July 20th. And I will be at Woodstock this year. Um, awesome. So that's another cool Luthier festival event thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the rest of them currently are blanking my mind. So if I've forgotten <laughs> anything, please the don't yell at me. <laughs> yes, exactly. There you go. Which one? This one. <laughs> Yeah, we'll put all put your links and everything in the description so people can find you online and yeah, find all the places they can see you play. That that's probably pretty good because if not, they're gonna find a numerous amount of different Matt Thomases. <laughs> no, yeah, I they're promise. gonna find the Matt Thomas. <laughs> this this one. <laughs> awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much. This has been so, such a pleasure to chat with you. And I think folks who have been watching the talking guitar interviews will really enjoy this too. So thanks again. Thank you guys for listening and thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking Guitar. As you might expect, all music featured in today's episode is performed by Matt himself. The intro, Ashokan Farewell, was played on his own Jewett OM Cocobolo, and the second piece playing now is an original of his called Sky's Eyes. And that was played on a Skytop Grand Concert Maple, which will be on display at the LeConnor Guitar Show later this month. While you can't buy Matt's Jewett, we do have four beautiful Jewett guitars in the shop now, and Jeff has two listed to order directly from him, so check the show notes for links if you're interested in learning more. If you're enjoying these interviews, please take a second to rate and review Talking Guitar on your podcast app, or give us a thumbs up on YouTube. It really does help, and I would love to hear your feedback. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at The North American Guitar. And as always, please come back next week for the latest episode.